Hello and welcome to the um, IWFM, Rising FM Special Interest Group um, with FMs around the world. I'd like to thank um, all of our speakers today who will be joining us um, for this uh, for this uh, webinar. Um, that's Plume Van Dusen, Mark White, Phil Richards and Katerina Ford. And I'd also like to thank all of you that have joined us um, to celebrate World FM Day and um, join join this uh, really exciting um, event that we've planned for you. Um, this has been uh, prepared by the uh, IWFM committee. Um, we have a team of us that uh, come together and um, prepare these events um, for each of you. We hope that they're exciting and that they offer um, a lot of kind of advice to new people that come into the industry. Um, and support anybody at any level of their career and help with um, anybody that is kind of moving jobs, starting a new job, coming into the career um, or coming into the industry. And, um, you know, it's a celebration of um, all of us that work in FM. And I think that's what um, World FM Day is also about. Um, so the com committee has an enthusiastic, enthusiastic group of professionals from all different um, backgrounds in, in management. Um, we all have a contribution into uh, the facilities management industry and a wealth of experience um, and knowledge and contacts um, within the industry as well. So, um, you know, feel free to contact us um, at any point. Um, we do have a Twitter page, um, as you can see, at IWFM, Rising FMs, and also on LinkedIn. And we're really encouraging you to all kind of follow us um, so you can keep in touch with us and also um, see any future events that we're planning and um, maybe give us a tweet and a bit of a mention um, uh, with your thoughts um, and obviously introducing other people within the industry um, to the IWFM Rising Special Interest Group. Um, I'll hand over to Scott Wilderspin, who will take on, who will introduce us to um, speakers and just give you a little bit more information on each of those um, that are joining us today. Over to you, Scott. Hello, just to note, uh, some of uh, the people today are um, unable to, uh, to put their camera up. So we do have Elliot, who's hosting alongside myself, um, who's on audio only, and, uh, and Plume Van Dersen as well, who's the first one I'm going to introduce, also on audio only. Um, so uh, Plume's background, a award-winning facilities management professional with extensive experience in workplace and facilities management. Plume is actually now a lecturer in, in the Netherlands for workplace and facilities. Um, and a previous chair of the IWFM Rising FM's uh, special interest group that we're part of. And Bill Richards, welcome Bill, uh, started his career in the landscaping industry, uh, moving into cleaning services and then into management, uh, specialising in the transport sector um, and, and established in soft services. Um, is now a regional lead with a £65 million portfolio based in Singapore, looking after eight countries. Uh, Mark, welcome Mark. Um, so looking at, it um, developed his career from a company called Churchill Services, instrumental in the growth in the north of England. Um, he became our, uh, the operations director um, and then relocated to Australia. And Katerina Ford, welcome Katerina. A long career in the FM industry, starting out in operations and progressing to a regional account manager role, uh, looking after large TFM contracts in a number of European countries. Um, and a niche and in international service delivery and managing people across a number of countries. We'll move on to my first question. And if we can start with Plume, um, tell us a little about your current role and, and, and how your career, career began with uh, in FM. Yes, thank you, Scott. First of all, apologies that I'm not here. I'm all dressed up nicely, put my makeup on nicely, and I'm audio only, but fine, um, we can do this. Um, and try and make it as interesting as possible. Um, so yeah, so I actually studied facility management and I know when I lived in the UK, I was one of the only few. So I studied facility management back in the Netherlands where I'm from originally. And after my internship in Australia, I realized that I didn't want to stay in the Netherlands just yet. So I moved to the UK to improve my English and kind of widen my network, gain some experience. And I've held several positions there. Um, um, and after winning the award in 2016, so the IWFM award, I uh, moved roles and was responsible for the um, or several EMEA contracts. 
So I've held, held, held twice EMEA contracts there. And after I went traveling and came back into another EMEA role, I thought, yes, what do I really want to do? And where do I get my passion out of? And I was really just trying to grow the people and sharing my knowledge in order to make them the best version of themselves. And um, I then was approached by my university um, where I studied initially if I wanted to come on board. So as Scott already mentioned, I'm now a lecturer in facility and workplace management. And yeah, teaching the new generation of EMS all about the in and out of the bar industry. That's fantastic. Thanks, Sir Um Same question for Paul. Thanks, Scott. Yeah, so um, I've been in the FM industry for just over 10 years now. Um, I actually started in the landscape industry. I was working on the underground account, uh, just purely doing ground maintenance, uh, so the tree work, that kind of thing. Um, during that time, the company I worked for actually uh, got absorbed during the 2P process into the, the larger FM account on the underground, where I was kind of exposed to other service lines of FM. Um, and I, I then moved into to cleaning and looked after uh, contract cleaning across multiple transport-based accounts, uh, such as Network Growl, obviously on the underground, um, Heathrow and Gatwick Airport, where he looked after too. Um, and during that time, um, I actually started being, being more interested in office space cleaning and kind of the, the high portfolio and like, the, the blue chip companies. Um, there was an opportunity that came within ISS um, where I moved over to manage the Bank of America account in the UK. Uh, we had five sites and one in Paris. Um, and then during that time, I kind of got a feel of the large organization uh, that ISS is. Um, I made, my interest started to shift towards uh, personal goals and what I could achieve in such a large, large organization um, as such as ISS. I then started reaching out across across the business um, and managed to get some good contacts in, in the global, global space, um, which is what gave me the opportunity to actually come out to Asia. Uh, so a couple of years ago, I started working directly for ISS Singapore, um, managing their British Embassy account. Um, and I was there up until uh, about seven, eight months ago, um, when ISS actually approached me to take on a larger role in the global business, um, looking after the, their largest regional account, uh, which is Citibank. So I'm currently there now overseeing eight countries in Southeast Asia, in, including Australia and New Zealand. That's where I'm now. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. Um, Mark? Hi Scott, thanks very much. Um, so I've been in the industry for uh, around 15 or 16 years. Um, I joined uh, the cleaning industry um, in mainly a retail portfolio uh, in, in the UK, but also over in the Netherlands as well. I, I did some work in the Netherlands with the same company I was working for. Um, and then I was very fortunate to join uh, Churchill um, in 2011. And I went through a period of exponential growth with, with Churchill over um, just over eight years. I joined them as an operations manager and went through different grades of management and when I left the business I was the account director for, for the JLL contract uh, for Churchill in the UK. Churchill are a very um, growth driven business, very entrepreneurial and they, they gave me lots of different um, opportunities to grow my career and learn, uh, new, learn new things. Um, it was always uh, my wife and I's dream to, to live in Australia so end of 2019 um, we took a plunge, I, I came over here with no role, no, no, nothing to come to um, I decided I was going to take you know, a few months off and find my feet and I lasted for about six weeks before I started looking for a job um, and again I've been very very fortunate to join a business here in Australia that is very similar to Churchill in 2011-2012 sort of where growth is, is, is a, a real uh, focus point for us, a very forward thinking business, very people focused and uh, so now I'm the state manager for Queensland and the Northern Territory um, which is uh, you know, a big patch when it comes to geography. It's a it's a four hour flight from Brisbane to my uh, my northern most northern contract, um, which is which is some going. Um, and I manage a mostly commercial uh, property, most of the towers in the CBD, uh, where it does, but a good sized commercial property portfolio um, here in Queensland. Yeah, thanks, Mark uh, and Katerina. Thank you. So yeah, as I said in my bio, I've been around in the business for a little while now. Um, I started off my career really early on as sales and quickly realized that my strength is actually in operations and people management. Um, so I first sort of had the first experience with FM uh, being an operations manager for Regis. And from then I took the plunge, I went and worked for Carillion as a facilities manager at the time for DEFRA, then moved on to um, 
the home office account i was there for a number of years again started off with a couple of sites grew and took a bigger geography um, and started having some sites outside of the uk so that was my first experience and um, currently i'm a, a regional account manager for cbre i'm on the dell technologies account and i oversee the service delivery over seven european countries uk obviously being one of them um, and this is the area I found the most excitement and something that really drives me. I, Pre-COVID, I really enjoy the traveling. I enjoy the, um, the challenges of the service delivery when you have to do it in the same delivery, but in different countries and you have to have a consistency. So um, I found that actually that is um, something I really enjoy and uh, I want to grow kind of from there. Oh, that's brilliant. Thank you. Uh, I like you. I, I, I love traveling between the different sites and that. So it is much harder to manage things, I think, out um, with the COVID uh, situation and not being able to travel and see what's happening on those different sites there. Yeah, um, I'd like to just ask a few questions, actually. I think um, there were some really, really interesting introductions there and everybody's taken kind of different routes uh, throughout their career. Uh, but Thank you, obviously, for the introductions on how your careers began, how, how your careers have uh, progressed. Um, I've got a question for Plune. Um, and my first question is, um, it's around, you mentioned that you traveling as kind of a kind of break prior to coming, kind of, kind of come back into the industry. Um, how, how, how would you recommend that to kind of other people within the industry that may be thinking of kind of going traveling, going on career break, um, taking a break from work, taking a bit of time out, and then kind of coming back, back to kind of FM and the industry. People that might feel a bit different about doing something like that, but is that something that you'd recommend doing? And how has that benefited your career? Um, yes, I, honestly, I couldn't recommend it more. To be honest, um, I went straight from uh, uni and moved to England and went into a very quite steep career path, if you would like to say. Um, or if I can say so myself. Um, and that has been really, really good. Um, but when I mentioned to different colleagues um, at the IWFM as well that I was going to travel, everyone was very, very in favor of that. Initially, I was a bit scared, like, oh, what happens if I've got a gap on my CV? Or, but everyone was so supporting and, and very happy for me to go. And I even met a lady. She said, like, I wish I'd done it earlier. I went traveling when I was 65, and I wish I did it earlier. So I would definitely, definitely recommend. I wouldn't necessarily say that you need 10 months out or a year out, even if you take any break kind of longer than a normal holiday. So I would say like two or three months where you can really switch off, not have to deal with your phone, not have to deal with your work and really don't, doesn't have, don't have to focus on your own responsibilities work related. Um, it would definitely benefit. And what I also noticed is um, I went traveling to South America um, when I was working in the UK, most of my cleaning staff were South American as well. So to travel to a different country, you really understand their culture, why they behave in certain ways, why they don't do certain things. Um, and I think wherever you go, you will just learn that not everyone is like you and not everyone is the same. Everyone has their own kind of ways of doing. And I think you, that's one part I learned from traveling. But also in me, you kind of, you realize that not everything is only always about your career. Like I was really, really happy on a very small budget, just traveling around doing um, my thing, not having to prove myself in a way to, to the industry that I'm good enough. And it was, it was, ni it was a nice feeling for once as well. And um, yeah, just to get kind of back with two feet on the floor, because I was always, oh, I still am, to be fair, but very, very ambitious. I need to be more, I need to be higher, I need to get bigger, I need to be better. And to just take a break for a while and just come back to you is also very important sometimes. Brilliant. Thank you. That's definitely some great advice for anybody that's um, considering uh, traveling, taking a career break. Um, so thank you very much for that. Um, Bill, um, you also mentioned that you were, um, kind of working around kind of Asia and Singapore, how, how is that different to um, maybe working in the UK? Um, how did you get going working in the UK? 
Um, it is definitely different. Um, obviously, the day-to-day -day work is technically the same, but you are dealing with different kinds of challenges. So, uh, simple things like pest control in the UK is pretty simple. Maybe some mice and rats in Singapore. You're dealing with king cobras and things that are not very pleasant. So, there's that element of from working in the UK is pretty um, set up pretty well. To be honest, you have the infrastructure around you, the countries or the, the where you're working is pretty standard. Um, where in Asia they each country is completely different from a from an operational perspective from how they see um, the importance of what they're doing from how they look after their staff even from the staff themselves how they see their job so it was more kind of when i first got here was to actually take a step back and, and learn more around the countries i mean and, and the cultures are very different as i said so it, i did come out here with this idea of okay great i'm going to bring all this knowledge from the uk and they know what they're doing that kind of thing but it, it was a step back where it was more of a learning um and how to kind of motivate the guys in a different way than, than you would back in the uk uh, but no it's, it's been very good but it, even now you still learn a lot just just from each country doing things so different it really is an eye-opener brilliant thank you very much i hope you haven't had to um deal with too many countries um that sounds like a completely different challenge to what we face um so thank you for that Mark, um, you also mentioned that you'd uh, made a change and moved to um, Australia. Um, yeah. So for other people that are um, are kind of considering moving out of the UK, uh, changing country, what kind of advice would you give to them for kind of looking for work in another country? Um, yeah. And how? Uh, I think, kind of sorry, uh, I think the important thing is to make connections early. So. Although I, I didn't have um, a, a, an offer when I came over, what I'd been doing for about a year before I came was make connections through LinkedIn, through trade bodies, through Twitter, uh, through anywhere where I could get a connection. Um, and I was you know, just making sure that I understood the industry over here as much as I possibly could. because I, I knew I was going to work in cleaning. So you, you always have that sort of direction that you're going to go in. Um, and making use of those social um, network platforms, anything where you can get information um, on a one-to-one -one basis is, is the best way to go, I believe. Um, coming over here and already knowing people, not, not physically, but knowing them uh, through, through LinkedIn, having conversations, having telephone conversations was a massive plus for me. Um, I didn't walk in blind. I, I already knew two or three people that I'd been speaking to for, for about that year. So make use of those, those forms of communication, make use of those, those ways of, of speaking to people elsewhere. Um, and because they will benefit you really when you uh, when you make the move. Brilliant, thank you. That's some great advice for anyone who's looking to do the same, and maybe considering uh, maybe a role in Australia or Singapore or anywhere else. That's that's fantastic. I, I agree with Bill, though. The the uniqueness of our risk assessments around dangerous things is uh, is is quite an eye opener. The, the spiders, the snakes, the you know, everything that can kill you is here. So including the weather. So <laughs> brilliant, thank you. Um, Katerina, if I, um, you mentioned that you've kind of gone from sales into an operation manager role and I'm just wondering um, how how did you find that change and what support did you get uh, in terms of um, going into that role, developing in that role and who did you need to kind of reach out to to be successful as an operations manager from a sales role? Um, that's a good, a good question. Uh, looking back, I will probably say that the um, the training program that we just had at the time, I, mean, I, I moved into that. I had a couple of smaller jobs uh, because I, I, first of all, I haven't said I grew up in Greece. Um, I came here about 20 years ago. So it took me a little bit of time, a couple of years to start you know, getting into the industry. And I got my first sort of opportunity with me just working in the city being responsible for one of their uh, serviced offices in, in, in bank. And they had a really good training program and induction program, and I had a really good mentor. So I, I've just found that naturally I was drawn to that uh, service delivery, drawn to operations, and I was better at it than I was actually in sales. So um, it didn't take me that long really to, um, to get going, but at the time, facilities management was a very different animal to what it is today. So it took another few years and mostly with Carillion and uh, later with Amy as well to get more qualifications around hard services, around engineering, around things that were more technical and more complicated and a lot of compliance that I had to do the training for. Um, but yes, it'd be that sort of the, the, the career into it. And I guess gradually over the years, 
Um, a lot of it has been learned on the job, but obviously people coming into the business now have more opportunities from a, a, a learning point of view, like Plume, who actually can do a degree in facilities management. That wasn't the case 20 years ago. So most people, I would say, I'm a facilities manager. They didn't even know what it was. I have to say, you know, I deal with property and, and that would be it. So a lot has changed since then. Yes, a lot has changed, I agree. Um, one of the key things that you mentioned there was uh, mentorship as well. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people feel that they would like to kind of have a mentor, but how would you recommend people go about uh, maybe finding someone who can mentor them and who they can have, help kind of develop their career? Um, good question. So in my current organisation, CBRE, we have a mentorship programme, so it's quite straightforward, but not every provider, every company would have that. So if your company doesn't provide you with uh, mentors, then I would recommend you reach out to, to a network. And again, networking through LinkedIn, I think is really important, IWFM, to meet people who have been in the industry a little bit uh, longer than yourself. And, you know, be brave. Just Ping someone and say, right, I want to, you know, I want to know more about um, wh what you do and how you could help me. And you find, I think, people are open and supportive to help um, new, uh, you know, new joiners into our industry. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to move on to question two. Um, I'm really keen to understand uh, what are the main challenges that you face when dealing with changing legislation, straight regulate, uh, regulations in your role? Um, there can be obviously differences um, between kind of UK and going into a role that is a little bit more widespread. Um, but have you found any new best practices that you would like to share? Um, I'll go over to Plume to answer that one first. Hmm. Um, to be fair, most of my career was in the UK, FM-wise. Um, and if I look at the different challenges that we faced during my career, um, we obviously moved to a new energy directive. We then moved into a GDPR privacy uh, legislation. And now, maybe not necessarily uh, a legislation as such yet, but obviously we have a lot of restrictions uh, and different re regulations around COVID. So, and I was in a way lucky that I also experienced that from an operations perspective because I did learn a lot in that half a year. And I think best practice to share our main challenges that we had as well. And this is like a very, uh, how do I say it? People are still very resistant to change. People don't like change, whether that's a law, a legislation, or just a minor thing in the office. And I think what we have to do, and I think what we definitely learned over uh, the last year is to be patient and to be very very clear on what you want and why you do it and I think that is if I look at for example just to not so much focus on the legislation part but more on the regulation with regard to COVID um, if you are not clear why we're moving stuff and um, what is currently being done people are just becoming um, they're uh, uninterested. They they are going to do their own thing behind your back. For example, I was looking after the uh, north of Europe for my last contract when COVID hit. Um, and yes, we were talking to, to our people on a regular basis. I would say like on a monthly meeting, we would talk to everyone. However, as you all experience probably, the rules are changing like every week or every two weeks. And people will start making their own assumptions and their own kind of rules around it because it suits them better. So I think if we just all together talk to them, but also include them in all the different conversations, so we have been doing this um, for X reason, or we have increased the cleaning, so you will feel better, or we have decreased cleaning, what happened at the beginning, because the offices obviously were empty. Um, yeah, think about what has been done, uh, or what is being done, and why it's being done, and just talk to people and then be patient in the process because it's a very different uh, experience for everyone. Of course, it has been. Uh, it's been, you know, quite fast paced. There's been a lot of changing as well, hasn't there? So um, it's, um, it, it's 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 some great advice there, great feedback. Um, Bill, uh, can I ask the same question to you? 
Yeah, of course. See, it's actually it's an interesting question to come up for me because at the moment, um, kind of local legislation and regulation changes don't affect me directly because I'm kind of in a regional role. So uh, I have to just make sure that my, my key account managers in each country are fully aware of any legislation changes that come through and just make sure we're driving the, again, the, the kind of buy-in from the team and why we do things is, is kind of what we are pushing for. Um, from a COVID perspective, it's actually, in my opinion, got a bit easier because most of the legislation or anything that's changing is actually to make the building safer um, and to make sure everyone, if they are coming into the office, are actually coming in in a, in a better condition and they're, they're being looked after better. So it's been an interesting turn where, as, as Plume said in the past, it's any changes is difficult. I've seen that from definitely from a COVID perspective, it's actually got a little bit easier because the kind of the safety first message is, is hitting hard because of the pandemic we're in. Um, but yeah, so just, just to kind of close, it's, it's more from my perspective of making sure that you're um, in close contact and regular conversation with your um, subject matter expert, which is there's normally a risk or compliance lead who leads these uh, discussions. And the big thing is that the team don't have to really interpret the new legislation. They should be driven by, by the subject matter expert and you kind of pass that message on and just make sure they're following wherever the new rules are. Yeah. Thank you, Bill. I think it's been quite, um, quite good that you've touched on the the fact that FMs are not always on their own, that there are other people out there to help them out. So subject matter experts are always going to be useful contacts for people to touch base with. So thank you for your advice. Um, we ask, go over to you to ask the same question on legislation and regulations and best practices, please. Yeah, I'm very fortunate in Australia that um, legislation and regulations are very similar here to, to the UK. We have uh, the um, Safe Work Australia, um, who are the equivalent of the Health and Safety Executive. Um, it really does come down to those SMEs though and I think it's important for anybody new coming into the industry when you're looking for a mentor or you're looking for um, advice and guidance don't just you know, kind of stick to the path that you're going on seek out those sub subject matter, uh, matter experts and, and look at legislation and regulations that are going to affect your role uh, further down the line one thing that has come up here um, that I'm very fortunate to be slightly ahead of the curve in Australia is the uh, Modern Slavery Act um, it's just coming into force here and we're all, uh, all the businesses are putting out frameworks now. The legislation is very similar to the UK so being involved in, in that with Churchill in the UK and, and making sure that the Churchill had a, the, the framework, not that I did the framework but I was closely guided by, uh, by our HSEQ team, um, it, it puts me a bit ahead of the game here so it's not all about catching up, you know you can, you, you can go back to like your previous experience in other countries and in other, in other industries to make sure that you, you, you know you've got that knowledge moving forward but SMEs all the way for me. You, you've really got to surround yourself both inside and outside of your own business with, with those experts. Brilliant. Thank you, Mark. That, um, what's really interesting there is that you've mentioned how you already had some experience um, with, from the UK, which you're able to transfer internationally. So really, it's about having the confidence that we do know what we we do as FMs and we do understand some of the regulations and um, that some of that is transferable elsewhere. Which is great. I think the the, the UK knowledge um, is is world leading. You know, it really is, and, and lots of it's not not just industry that take that knowledge. It's governmental um, bodies as well. Now they'll they'll take a lead from the UK because they really do uh, push that legislation uh, forward, especially when dealing with things like modern slavery and health and safety and all those things. And Churchill, um, very early on in, in in their development, invested really heavily in in, in that uh, in that piece to make sure that they were fully covered. And and I benefited massively from working with some really good um, HSCQ managers with with Churchill. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Mark. Katerina, if I can go over to you. Yeah, so I'm going to echo everybody else that I heavily rely on the subject matter experts. I work really closely with all the QHSC and technical advisors in the country because I have a quite diverse portfolio. I've got four Nordic countries, the UK, and I've got Spain and Italy. So different ways and different legislations, different requirements. So I won't be able to uh, keep myself up to date uh, if I didn't have these uh, close relationships and partnerships with my colleagues. Um, also, what we found the last 12 months with COVID is that we have to really align ourselves with what our client is doing and what regulations perhaps they want to see coming into the workplace. And if you have a global client, then again, those regulations will be across borders and there'll be some standardization. So you have to work really closely with your client. So you make sure that, um, you know, their ideas and regulations actually also you know, you're following local um, legislation and regulation as well. 
Lovely. Thank you, Katerina. Scott, over to you. Thank, thanks there, uh, Elliot. And uh, thank you, everyone. There seems to be some really key themes that uh, seem to be coming out of those conversations there. Um, especially around the subject matter experts and the uh, and networking as a whole for the mentoring programs and, and things like that. So there's some really good things for our our followers to to uh, to hook into there and, and try and follow up on. Um, our third question is really looking at cultural change. Um, I know we're doing loads of work uh, here in the UK. Um, I'm part of a, a global organisation, and this is being driven across. Uh, the globe around um, pushing more towards the workplace and, and, and no longer is it just a, a box that we walk into and and people have to adhere to the rules that we put down um, it's what um, people see as what can we deliver what what can we how flexible can we be in the workplace and how can we change these things to suit uh, the needs of the colleagues who are working there um, so it'd be interesting to see what cultural differences we've got there um, across the workplace both positive and the negative impacts really um, can we start with Plume? What, what have you seen so far? Yes, I just unmuted myself. Um, well, I've I've only again worked in in the UK initially uh, in the FM industry, but when I moved to the Netherlands, and I think most of you or most of the world knows that the, uh, the Dutch are quite direct and uh, we can be very straightforward, straight to the point. Uh, but I only realised it. Uh, when I worked in the Netherlands basically for the first time in my professional career and where in England, not so much necessarily by the, the workplace now, but more about your colleagues and other people is um, uh, in London, like you're very uh, individual, you're, you're very often career focused as well. And yes, they're interested, but also very much interested on in their own lives. In the Netherlands, they don't mind asking you. So if they, if you say, um how are you and you say yeah i'm okay that means something is up and you're bound to get another question what's up really or if you would say like oh i got a doctor's appointment you're 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 bound to be questioned uh what exactly are you going to do in hospital is it serious what toe are you missing whatever it goes so in depth and that is something i really have to get used to that I basically every time I put something in my diary, I have to explain to 20 colleagues <laughs> what I'm going to do in hospital. Um, so not necessarily from a workplace perspective as such, uh, but from from a people's perspective, the cross-cultural difference have been have been huge. And I think if I look at a workplace specifically, um, I study facility management, and one thing that uh, a lot of people find found good in me and, and liked me is that I'm very customer service focused, very hospital hospitality focused, um, but also very people focused. So yes, of course, processes and the industry and, and the rules and like regulations are very, very important, but at the end of the day, your people have to do it. And uh, when I'm now back at the university, that is still something that we heavily rely on and heavily teach. It's, it's all about the customer service. And I do have, I have seen a shift in the UK especially that it is coming like cleaners are not only called cleaners they're also called hosts they're called any other kind of um, job titles and I think that it's a beautiful thing that they are also just recognized as people who create the experience for you rather than just clear the mess that you leave so that's one of the shifts that I've seen personally that's really interesting and um, and I'm sure with your, your experience that you've got you're able to deliver more to your uh, your your lectures um, with that first-hand experience there. It, have they changed the educational syllabus to include workplace in there? Uh, as yes. A part of the yeah, so I'm now teaching the first year students and one of my courses actually workplace management, so we're designing a whole new workplace based upon a um, redesigned motive, so that's quite interesting. There was not something that was in there when I was studying nearly 10 years ago. Um, but also when I'm now looking to the future, because obviously the people I'm teaching at, uh, teaching now, um, they're going to graduate in four years. So they are, I'm really kind of trying to play towards the trends and development. And we're really already trying to look, okay, how can we incorporate data analytics and all the censoring that's really up and coming. And when I was in the UK, yeah, companies are very interested. However, it is still very expensive. So everyone is a little bit waiting for the, the first kind of companies to, to buy into it. So to see, what the outcome is to then kind of further progress in that and that's something that we are now looking into to include like in our basic curriculum as well so we are constantly developing it 
that's really great that's great to hear and bill how's the cultural change across your portfolio so it's, it's actually an interesting one because uh when i was in uk obviously i was i was in uk and i was managing a, a u.s based bank um i moved to asia i then managed the uk british embassy so you get to the uk and now i'm in city bank which is a u.s bank so from a culture perspective it hasn't actually changed because it's kind of governed by america or, or uk um but but you can definitely see a focus shifting from fm from a few years ago where it was purely i want an office clean and i want my lights on to this kind of pushing for workplace experiences and it's more around how the end user is feeling and joining talent because the places where you want to be working are more elaborate and more kind of uh, functioning for you to just be kind of your mental health improves at work it's more around how you feel at work more so than the actual just come to the office um, so the, I mean, the big, the big thing that I've loved about this is it's a constantly evolving model now where there's always something newer and better. It's no longer just, oh, you've cleaned the building. Okay, great, everyone does that. It's now there's constantly best practices being shared amongst colleagues, amongst contracts, amongst competitors at times where you see somebody, somebody doing something really good and you're kind of constantly sharing all the good things and achievements you're doing. The negative side for that in, in Asia is actually um, not all the countries are capable of delivering what, what clients are expecting. So you have Singapore or Australia, for example, which is pretty much ready to go. Um, to other countries like the Philippines and Vietnam or Vietnam, where it's not as easy to implement um, what other countries see as quite a simple thing. So kind of judging the judging expectations, make sure everyone fully understands what actually can be achieved. Um, it is difficult at times because it's kind of, oh, it's one regional account, I want it all the same. But, but some countries, just, it's just not that easy. Um, so that's kind of what I've seen from, from a cultural change perspective. Yeah, no, that's, that's really great. And, and, and to echo your, your comments there, we've had travellers move across various offices and, and they've got something really great in their office and then they come to another office and they're like, can we have this? And I'm like, Shh, we haven't quite got there yet, but it's another thing we're going to introduce soon. Um, so the secrets are out the bag and everyone's talking about it and saying, oh, it's on its way, it's on its way. So no, that's yeah, exactly. really, really great. Um, Mark, what's the cultural uh, differences there? So, on a personal level, the, the, the pace of life, the pace of business here is, is completely different to the UK. You know, so um, you really do have to slow down. I think it may just be Queensland. I'm not sure it's the whole of Australia, maybe certainly not Sydney, but uh, certainly in, in Brisbane, um, as I say, and she'll be right. And it's you know, it just means just slow down a bit. You know, <laughs> it'll, it'll happen when it happens. So you, know, you, you do come in with the, with the kind of pace that you had in the UK you quickly have to learn that things don't work that way you know there, there is a, a much different way uh, of doing business here and it's it is, it is a bit slower no, no, no less um impactful you know it, it's, we still get the same amount done but just at, but at a different pace i think from a, a recent cultural change perspective what we're seeing here and i hope you're seeing in the uk is, is a resetting of that balance um of how cleaners are seen and what the importance of cleaning actually is you know it's no longer that race to the bottom you know we 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 were in the past just the, the, the forgotten minority in a, in a building, but we spend so much time there. We see so much that goes on in the building and we have access to data and we have access to information that is very valuable to building owners and, and, uh, and FM providers. Um, and I think that that cultural shift now where cleaning has taken a, a forward role in, in providing safe and clean environments for people to return to work. And that's what the building owners want. They want those people to come back into the office. Um, but also where we can provide additional information and data around that building. You know, connectivity, um, you know, innovation through technology, all of those things are, are moving forward and, and at some pace now because of the requirement of, of COVID. So a real shift back to actually putting clean at the forefront is a, is a real cultural change for me. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting, actually. We were talking about this um, recently, and one of the best skill sets for a, a daily housekeeper was to blend in and camouflage themselves into the wall whilst cleaning at the same time. And now we've gone the full sort of circle. We want them to be completely visible and seen all the time. Yeah, uh, COVID has probably ex uh, accelerated this, but we want that, yeah. that message out there that we are constantly cleaning all the time. And, and please excuse the cleaners, but they're, they're there to help and make the workplace a safe place. You know, it's, it's that heads up service. We want people to be approachable. They know about the building. They know where they go. They know about the shopping centre, whatever it is. And, you know, they, they probably spend more time there than most of the staff who work there um, in, in lots of cases. So. You know, having a, 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 a team member, a cleaner who can communicate, who knows what they're doing, who is proud of their work, who is properly uniformed, properly equipped, you know, th those things are, are really at the forefront of the industry here now. 
That's, that's great. Uh, Katerina, um, what culture uh, no, changes? What else to add? <laughs> so I think the biggest change, and again, quite similar to what my colleagues mentioned, is that we've gone from um, an environment where it was all about um, having a clean building, having you know compliance in our maintenance, and and a good customer service, to actually look at end user customer journey, and the end user being the forefront of our attention, and everything else is built around. The, uh, the, that end user journey. So it encompasses everybody who works in facilities, not just the receptionist, but as we said, the, the cleaning team, the engineering team, the handyman, everybody who's involved in that operation is part of that customer journey. And this is something I think I've seen the biggest impact and a lot of companies now, a lot of contracts from service providers would have workplace um, champions or workplace managers as part of their uh, solutions to uh, TFM contracts because again the, the focus is a lot on the workplace experience which is fantastic. Yeah it is lovely to see that many of our titles are changing and people are mm. focusing more on that workplace management um, side of stuff. Yeah. Thank you. Elliot? Scott. So um, Moving on to question four, what have the last 12 months been like for you and what have you learned about your approach to the workplace and your teams? If I go over to Plume, please. Um, I've mentioned it quite similarly, or a similar answer already, but I think the last 12 months I was quite lucky to start in a situation where all the offices were closed and we were in the process of actually making them COVID ready for what we hoped after summer. This didn't uh, happen. But that was an initial kind of um, step. And what I learned there was just a lot of quick thinking, um, a lot of quick um, changes as well. But most of all, as I mentioned before, talking to your teams, explain why you're doing things. Because not just so much my team, but also my clients, they didn't, they didn't understand why we would just get double the amount of cleaners or why we still had cleaners and the building was closed or why we would have a completely a complete floor just unoccupied why couldn't we have large team meetings with like three meters in between but still have that kind of hustle on the in the office and yeah i think to to, to em em emphasize with them and be able to um to try and see it from their side but also try and um talk with them and think with them on what the possibilities actually are helps them in kind of accepting the situation a little bit better and um, I would like I would wish that the Netherlands was also a country where it was like yes 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 everything is fine it's all for safety but people are sick of it unfortunately and very very stubborn as I said before the Netherlands is also a country where if it doesn't go their way they will just do it behind the scenes so you have to really try and engage with them at least to try and stick to the rules as much as possible. Um, but yeah, that's that's kind of my main takeaway from this. Emphasize to people, make sure that you keep connecting with them on a very regular basis and also to your teams, what exactly is expected from them. And yeah, don't over promise things because that's what I think a lot of us, including the government has happened or has done uh, in the past. So now it's just, let's see where it will take us. Thank you very much, Clay. Um, over to Bill on the same question. Yes, uh, the last 12 months have been uh, challenging, to say the least. I mean, no, nobody could have uh, ever planned for, obviously, what everybody's going for the moment. But there's been some some kind of real key things that have uh, really, really affected how, how we've had to manage. So things like the government control measures, which shutting down workforce, you can't move around. Trying to navigate your way around simple getting people on site has been, has been a challenge. But I mean, we've been working very closely in the Singapore, especially with local governments. So they've actually been hotels, been designated for our staff and that kind of thing. So it's been it's been helpful that although these are all challenges, um, everybody's in it together. So I've seen a real kind of drive from communities all over to be like, okay, yeah, this is a problem, but we're going to help you through it. Um, and with the same thing, we had weird issues with supply chain for consumables, um, down to locations closing and opening. It was all last minute and it was, everyone's kind of learning at the same time. Um, but also the big thing is that the, the future's kind of approached us quicker than we thought, where 
you, we were thrown into this kind of quickly and now people are understanding how um, important it is to maybe work from home or how we work virtually and how important technology can be from a safety perspective and it's kind of pushed us probably forward five five or ten years from uh, having to change the basic fm into this model of it being adaptable and, and pushing for things you wouldn't have thought of like well how would we uh, to help you work from home and things like that so um but it's all just been about contingency and trying to plan for as many things as you can think of um, and just keeping it as, as a live fluid document because there was always a time where we got a perfect plan for this and then there, something would come in which would knock out of sync. So it's just been, I've learned to really um, never kind of accept that this is the way forward and things can just change and you've got to be able to adapt to that. Um, but the big thing is just, just to be able to actually keep the staff morale up throughout all the countries because They've, I've had staff that themselves have had COVID, uh, their family, their wives, uh, and just to, to give them a massive pat on the back that to still come into work and be positive and do the job they're doing in an environment which is obviously they're cleaning. So you know, an environment which is potentially infected at times. We, we've, been, we've been looking after the actual disinfection. So to keep the morale up um, has, has been something that's really, really kind of given me good insight into how how positive the teams are, you know, and it's even during all this, they're still coming in smiling and it's important to reward that the best you can. Um, so yeah, it's just been a challenge, but it's definitely been a learning a learning experience. You need to take away some positives and, and it is that you, you do become more adaptable uh, to take kind of every environment after this. Thank you, Bill. Um, and same question to Mark, please. I think um, I'm very fortunate, or some of us are very fortunate, to actually work in an industry where we've seen increased demand uh, over the last 12 months. You know, there's, there's lots of people out there not in the same position as us. Lots of people have have, um, have lost their work, and you know, specifically in Australia, we we haven't seen the same levels of, of, of COVID that lots of other countries, especially the UK, uh, have seen. So we're kind of in this this little bubble where we're still affected by COVID, but nowhere near the the, the same amount um, as, as other countries. Um, one thing I, I've personally done and, and my business, our, our company has done, is, is really paid that emphasis on people, you know, motivating teams, as, as Bill said, and, um, you know, paying attention to, to people's needs, their fears, you know, what they want from from, uh, from their employment. That's been key for us because we've seen an increased demand, but also, you know, an unsettled workforce in, in, in terms of are they going to keep the job? Are they going to become ill? Um, so, you know, it, that, that emphasis on people has, has been absolutely key to it. And, I've gone kind of through this learning process as well from emigrating in the last 12 months. It's it's it's, it's been a been a challenge. It, it really has. But I'm very fortunate to to work in a very forward thinking business. I'm very fortunate to be in a country that we are you know, relatively unaffected uh, in, in in terms of other countries by by, by COVID. Thank you very much, Mark, for your experiences. And um, Katerina, um, same question to you, please. Yes. Yeah, so, again, like everybody else, you know, uh, we have been affected and personally, my um, way of working has completely changed because I was so used to be able to to travel extensively. I was on the road at least, you know, one or two weeks every month going to different countries and sites and whatnot. So I was used to be able to manage my team more face to face and that was taken away incredibly quickly. So I had to use you know all the tools available and and be creative on how to maintain the same you know um, team um, momentum and team um, energy when we were fighting you know a pandemic at the same time but the positive thing I found through this experience over the last year is that because we have been forced to use more technology there's been more video actually my team have seen more of my face the last 12 months than they had seen in the previous two years and we have brought down some boundaries so everybody you know was more ac accessible and maybe a little bit more personable so even if having a video where they see you know your home and you're sharing one we've had to use whatsapp groups and all sorts of um tech to be able to stay connected and that was a positive that aside and positive experience that came out of the last 12 months of working with remote teams um, and from a workplace point of view, again, I think like, especially what Plume said, that it's managing people's expectations. And if anything, we have now a big focus and drive on making sure our buildings are safe and clean. Um, 
but we, we're still not really fully operational. So it's managing the expectations when we do start opening again all our buildings, if, well, the customers are going to come in and the end users, it's going to be a very different environment for them. So we have to do a little bit maybe of hand-holding and explain all the new processes and the new protocols and what they can and cannot do and so the meetings we talked about, you know, you can't have too many people in one room. Um, and just drive a little bit more awareness, but um, I'm positive that, you know, this has been a difficult experience for everybody. However, there have been some good things come out of it as well. Thank you, Katerina. It's certainly been a it's certainly been a year where we've all had to adapt um, and yeah. change the way that we're working. Um, it's definitely been um, a different way of communicating with our teams, and um, you know, it sounds like everybody's done a fantastic job over the last twelve months. And um, there's a lot of positivity to take out of it as well. Um, over to Scott. Thanks, Elia. Um, so we've we've touched on a lot of stuff there about the last twelve months. Um, and this one has really got to be the uh, the burning question that's asked in every webinar that I think I've been on, and everyone's talking about it. Um, and we've even got um, people across uh, our workplace who are uh, self-professed experts now at what's going to happen uh, moving forward. But what, what what's your uh, perception of people returning to the office or taking the working from home route? We can start with Plune on that one, please. Yes, it's a very interesting one, obviously. Um being in the industry and now being in a role where I'm trying to teach the students about the industry in a couple of years time because um, at, the, at the start of the curriculum we, we would talk about oh before corona before corona we did this before we, corona the office managed this way and I think something I mentioned to my colleagues as well I think we have to stop saying before corona we did this but just kind of phase into there might not be a before corona there will be just possibly a hybrid working uh, for every industry uh, possible. And I think what I've seen, quite similar to what Catherine said as well, like um, it, it works quite well to see your team so often uh, via, via phone calls. And um, when I look at my career before uh, I joined, as a joined the university as a lecturer, I was on the road a, lo a lot and I lost a lot of time by just traveling two sides and um to different countries and and it's so much quicker for a quick conversation just to jump on an online on an online call so i think a lot of people have seen the benefits in 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 this type of working however i also see that a lot of people still miss the miss the kind of the personal feeling with with their colleagues in the office the maybe the friday afternoon drinks the um just to celebrate success together sometimes just to catch catch up on how you're doing as a person and and that is definitely a big miss in in a lot of offices and i think in every industry too so i do think there will be a hybrid type of working so we will be working from home more but i don't think the offices will be disappearing completely there might be like meeting hubs every here um uh, like here there and everywhere instead of having one main head office but yeah, we'll see what the future brings, but that's definitely something that we are focusing on as, as, as lecturers too, because where are we going forwards and, and how will the future look? That's brilliant. Thanks, Plum. Bill, are you seeing change on your portfolio or perception change? Yeah, I mean, it, it does vary. Um, country to country, it varies. I mean, here in Singapore, they're pushing for 70% occupancy, and in places like the Philippines, it's nobody's in. So you do see a massive shift from a kind of mandated when you should return, but it's, it's important for us in the, in the job we do is we can actually heavily, heavily influence our clients here where we can make them feel more secure with our adaptive ways of working. You know, we can have touch point focused cleaning, so they more, feel more secure that it's obvious that there's more cleaning in the high touch areas and the transmission risk is less. Um, but personally, I, I echo what, what Plume said. I mean, the, people are underestimating the, the people aspect of, of being at work. Um, I mean, personally, I, I've been in the office throughout because it, we, we were allowed to have exceptions and I've been there for the team, mainly to show that I'm there too. Um, but I've seen a big, a big increase in just productivity in the building from kind of emails and virtual calls to physical meetings and the atmosphere and there's like an energy back at work and people kind of miss that. Um, yeah, and the other thing is, me, me personally, I, I actually don't like working from home. It's, I, I just really struggle to have my living room be my office and my personal space. It's like I like that five o'clock laptop after leave the building. 
because I actually shut off properly. And when I work from home, I kind of, I don't really shut off. Um, the laptop's right there, my phone still goes. It doesn't, I don't get that kind of, ah, oh, that's, I'm ready for the next day now. Um, so I think it's important for people to see past the, the um, convenience of working homes. It is great, it's great to, to be at home and if you've got families and stuff, then it's fantastic. But there is something missing that they need to, to really think about of the benefits of being back in the office. Now you can get that kind of interactivity going. So yeah, that's, that's kind of my, uh, that's how it's been going here. Thanks, Bill. Mark, how about in Australia? Yeah, I, I completely agree with everyone saying. I, I think it's very telling that we all smiled and nodded when Flume mentioned Friday afternoon drinks. You know, that was uh, something we, we can all uh, sort of latch onto there. But it, it does come down to those water cooler moments. You know, those those in encounters you have in corridors where you know you, you'll have a conversation and all of a sudden it's an idea and then it's a it's a business plan and before you know it you're moving forward something. You know, you, you can't really put a value on those things and. I think at the start of the COVID crisis, um, the pandemic, there, there was this talk of a, a working from home revolution. You know, it was going to be the end of offices, but the, I think those initial peaks in, period in, in productivity have started to dissipate. You know, they, they really have started. They, 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 they've reached a point where you're not going to get that interaction. You're not going to get that creativity from being alone in, in your own front room. It, you know, it happens when you are involved in a, a working environment with your peers and, and your colleagues. And, there is a big push here in Australia now, um, similar occupancy levels to, to Bill said there, about 70%, you know, uh, building owners, employers, um, be it with um, the social distancing measures in place, which I guess in, in some ways helps that workplace environment where we're looking at the design of buildings, we're looking at the proximity of desks to each other, instead of ramming people into a, you know, to one floor, do we need to take two? So there is a, a move to a, a better working environment but there's definitely a push to bring people back into the office now. It's uh, it, it's really happening. That's brilliant. Thanks, Mark. So, Katarina? Yes. Um, all the research and, and trends are indicating that most businesses are going to be moving into a hybrid model if they haven't already. Uh, what I'm seeing is, is different culture, different countries. People are more keen than others to go back into the office. So, in my portfolio, it seems that the um, the Nordic countries, people are feeling more isolated, so they're more keen to go to the office. The southern countries are still a bit worried and more reluctant, so I'm seeing less um, footfall coming in. But I think a lot of companies, especially global companies, would have had five, ten year plans on their workplace and a lot of digital transformation. And some of these plans have just been brought forward early because of the pandemic. So things are already going to happen. They're just happening a little bit sooner. And I, I can't see us going back to being 100% office based unless there's a requirement from a, a particular business. But majority of our clients seem to be going through a hybrid model and also hybrid model when it comes to meetings as well. Where you have meetings where some people will be in the room and some people will be dialing in, which we didn't really have before. Everybody would be in one conference area or wouldn't be at all. Um, so I think these are the kind of the trends coming um, to us. Yeah, and that's brilliant. I mean, it's great to see. We're probably all thinking along the same here with the hybrid model and and and, and trends along that. So that that's really great. Elliot, thank you, Scott. So the final question is really um, about some advice to um, others that are in FM and uh, developing their career. Um, you've all had fantastic careers so far, and obviously we hope that they go, you know, very successfully, kind of going forward. But for other people, what is the best advice that you could give them for developing their career and the best way for them to go about doing so? If I can go over to Plume. All I can say is do it. Do it, do it, do it. I love the industry. I've been passionate about the industry since I started studying it. I absolutely love it still. Um, I also, I think these times kind of, showed that how valuable our industry is as well, how flexible we can be and how um, interesting it can get as well. Um, but as a tip in general, and I think, well, I know um, that Mark has mentioned it on a couple of times and the others as well, is that networking is so important. And I think uh, when you do start out, when you have made a decision to start in, in FM, make sure that you to, to speak to people and, and to connect with people because it's so interesting to hear all these different people from different industries. Because I think if you think about facility management opposed to other industries, we are everywhere. As, as Bill might be 
or have has worked in in landscaping and Catherine Katrina sorry um Katrina in in like a region kind of meeting meeting spaces where Mark comes from cleaning and we're all in the industry of FM so we all have um similarities but very very different specialties and I think that is so interesting to to find out about and to connect about and learn about as well so um yeah you use your network because it just helps you move forward but apart from that I think um enjoy it I can't say anything else just do it enjoy it and make sure that you use your network to um uh to, to grow yourself as well thank you Pauline um it's interesting that you've uh, mentioned the networking because obviously that's something that um away from you know um some of the online systems that obviously we can use and online places that we can go to hopefully it'll be something that we can all do again in person very very soon um, and i'm sure we all miss that um bill if i could ask you the same question yeah i mean if i'm also giving some advice i mean in my opinion fm is based on experience you know uh, going with an open mind uh, be patient it is a continuing learning environment um you may have a lot of knowledge in in a certain field but there's so many people around you who can teach you and, and you need to you need to become a sponge you need to be able to absorb all the information you can whether it's a cleaning operative who comes in with a new cleaning idea take it on board you know because it's something that they're on the ground showing us an improvement same as high level clients you know they, they will see the world in a different way you have to not always uh, think you know best and there is a perfect solution but there is always a way to adapt and, and to improve that um, Collaboration is key, as everybody said, the networking piece is huge. It's a lot easier now with, with LinkedIn and IWFM and places like this, uh, but also just general colleagues, you know, most of the, most of the accounts you're in um, will have similar roles, similar accounts. So it's important to, to share best practice and even share things that are not going right, because it's highly likely that, or it's incredibly likely that something you're dealing with is being dealt with somewhere else or has been dealt with, and there's already a great way to, to manage yourself through it. Um, and finally, just just because you're going into FM in, in a specific service line, like landscaping, doesn't mean that's where you're going to end up. So it's important to understand the bigger picture of, of, of FM and understanding different people's stories and how they have jumped around and, and got to successful positions. Um, it doesn't end with, with kind of one service line or one aspect. So again, just, just talk to people and keep an keep open mind. And, and the harder you work in it, it definitely pays off. Um, generally, the people I speak to who have jumped around the globe and jumped into different kind of services is all said the same thing. It was, oh, I'd, I'd like to have tried that. So they start asking questions to the right people, and, and it works out, you know. So, yeah, just just keep at it. It's, it's a great industry to be in. It's not going anywhere. It's, it's going to be be safe, I think, for a long time to come. Thank you very much, Bill. Uh, thank you. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a journey, and uh, we're all we're all on a journey. Um, in our careers um, so we're all developing every day and um, who knows where we can all kind of end up um, Mark over to you yeah I think um, key to it is, is finding a business or joining a business that is, is people focused you know it's yes we are um, we all work in the FM industry but if you can find that that company that um, allows you to be entrepreneurial that um, allows you to learn from experience um, you know look at different aspects within their business and that, that is a, a real key to it. There are so many different facets within our industry. You don't have to be pigeonholed, like Bill was saying, into those, you know, into landscape or cleaning or, or sales, or whatever it is. You know, become a subject matter expert. It could be social media, it could be marketing, it could be, you know, it doesn't have to be, you know, the nuts and bolts of, of what we, we do every day. I think we, if we can get that picture out to, to people who are considering the, joining the FM industry, we will be attracting talent that wouldn't only look at the industry as, as, a, as a first choice, but also as a fallen into, into the industry uh, through necessity. But people actually choosing to come work for us because we are an ever-evolving, innovative business, in an innovative industry, um, I think that is, is, uh, is, is a great thing. And I, I love working here as well. I love everything uh, about the industry. Thank you, Mark, and I'm sure we'll see a lot more people um, in the future choosing uh, facilities management as a, a, a kind of choice for them, um, and not just something that maybe they might have fell into, as may have happened for a lot of us in the past. Uh, thank you for that, Mark. Um, Katerina, over to you. 
Um, maybe like everybody else, I think it's uh, a fantastic that uh, young people actually have more choices now when joining this industry and it's, um, you know, the opportunities are greater. One, I think, a tip I would have is for any uh, person joining this business and uh, or progressing within FM is to seek innovation. You know, the, the clients are now are driving new solutions. They need more from just the basic, you clean and you maintain a building. They are constantly pushing for for new ideas and, and improvements in their workplace. So through your network, through uh, educating yourself, through social media, through every tool you can get hold of, learn more about innovation in the workplace. I think that would really help. A network, network, network. There's not enough of that. That needs to be something that everybody does on a daily basis. It's part of how you operate. It's not something you think about once a week. Brilliant. Thank you, Katerina. Um, networking is certainly important and I hope that um, a lot of us will kind of take that message on board over the course of the next year and network as much as you possibly can. Um, thank you to all of our uh, speakers. I'm just going to uh, pass over to Scott just to wrap up um, the session, um, just for some closing thoughts. Um, yeah, so some brilliant stuff there and, and, and some lovely messages there about change, innovation, the ideas piece, um, hunting down the subject matter experts um, and uh, the mentor programs, but networking being the key piece there. I think that actually bolts everything together and a lot of our followers, followers would be uh, really wise to stretch their networks as far as they can and, and, and talk to as many people. Um, so um, IWFM and the Risings uh, Volunteer Special Interest Group, we're here to help. Um, so no matter where you are on your uh, FM career, your journey, um, we can provide support, help, we can provide uh, events such as this one today and that will give you an insight into how to progress and, and, and how to help with those ideas and the innovation and the, and the change that is constantly happening. So reach out to the committee if you'd like some support or some help. Um, the committee uh, has got a, a, a big skill set out there, Bernard Crouch, Conrad Dinsmore, Amy Williamson, myself, Scott Wilderspin, Michelle Brightley, Elliot Ballantyne and Ian Haithwaite. Um, all here to support and they've all got very various different um, skills within the industry that we're there to help with. A big thank you to all our speakers today. Thank you for some really great information there for sharing those ideas um, and also thank you uh, to Elia and the rest of the committee who've managed to pull this all together. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.